And uh, the Lord was really speaking to my heart regarding the Word and the Holy Spirit and how both are essential. And, uh, and it really came through the messages. And um, it was like confirmation. And, and, so, um, and so what I'm wanting to do the, the, the next two Wednesday nights is uh, to just really review these messages uh, and then have a discussion regarding uh, just two of the messages side by side because it kind of just really puts it in the whole emphasis of the conference it, just by those two messages. And so I thought it would be really, really good because, you know, we believe in the whole counsel of God and we've been studying it through. As a matter of fact, we've gone through the entire word one time already as a church from Genesis to Revelation, every verse, every chapter, every book, all the way through. It took 14 years, but we made it. And now we're going back through on our, about our fourth year or so. And um, it puts the sword of the spirit in your hand to do battle against the enemy who comes and plagues you with undermines you any which way he can try to do that. But when you have the sword of the spirit, it, it's a game changer in the battle. And uh, when you think about battles as an example, uh, intel is very important. And the person who has intel usually has the upper hand in a battle. And that's why they, they make an emphasis of that in war to try and get, you know, the uh, information that the, uh, the enemy has. Well, you know what, we have information in a battle that 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 just reaffirms that we're the victors and uh, more than conquerors and so forth. So um, I think it's huge. And so we're going to do that, uh, put a pause again um, to that. And then um, and then also, uh, so we're having this conference because it speaks foundational to those who would struggle with, uh, you know, uh, their worldview, you might say. And, uh, you know, in the beginning, God. And uh, just Genesis 1-1 tells us, in the beginning, God. It's not uh, something that um, we question because there's things that are observable that we can look around. You know, you have the natural man with their worldview that uh, they try and prove no God. It's almost like a card house or a card bridge leading to their worldview. There's nothing observable. And their whole point is to try and prove their logic with the foundation that there is no God. And so it's a card house. But then you have the spiritual natural man, you might say, filled with the spirit that has observable, observable evidence of a designer and a creator that is off the charts, amazing. And that bridge of his understanding is undergirded by there is a God. And everything about it is solid. And so foundation is huge. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because in Romans chapter 1, Paul he writes, verse 20 and 21, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And so... You know, that's the direction of those who try to prove their worldview without God. And so they're, in their foolishness, their hearts are darkened. I was teaching a home Bible study one time, and I was teaching uh, Genesis. This is when we first came to Oregon, like in 90, it was, it, we were here about a year, 93. And, uh, and then this lady, as I'm teaching creation, a literal six-day creation, this lady jumps up in the home study wailing, weeping, and runs out of the house. So after the study, I sent a couple of ladies that were there, one of them being my wife, go next door. She was a neighbor. Find out what happened. She didn't believe, she's a Christian, she didn't believe in the literal six day, and she started weeping in, in, in that study because she realized, I'm not going to come back to this home study, which I like so much because of his position. 
And I thought, how sad. So I never, I never you know, was in that situation. But that it was an issue. But it's so, it's so important. And uh, in John chapter 5, verse 46 and 47, Jesus says, Do not think, no, for if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do, do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So there's the acceptance of the very foundation of the book of Genesis in, in just stepping up and believing Jesus Christ himself. And then a passage, one last passage that, uh, that I want to read is Jesus, after his resurrection, was talking to two of his disciples who uh, did not understand. And Jesus says in Luke 24, in verse 25 through 27, and he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so Jesus used the Old Testament, starting with Moses and the prophets, the things that were already written to validate his resurrection. And so when you begin to discount any portion of the word of God, let alone the very foundations of all that God has done, then the enemy is able to rush in and to undermine your position. And so uh, that's the purpose for you know, this, um, this time uh, together. And so, and so anyway, uh, so David and Mary Jo are here from uh, Alpha and Omega Institute in uh, Grand Junction, Colorado, to share with us. And so um, anyway, just welcome David as he comes up here. As we uh, begin this morning, I've invited uh, uh, Alan Nance, uh, who's from Fredericksburg, Texas, to share a few words. Uh, I first met Alan at uh, one of our family camps years and years ago, and uh, he kept coming and kept coming and kept coming, and I said, this guy's a slow learner, uh, for year after year, right? <laughs> but we finally said, okay, you've been coming enough, you start teaching this stuff. <laughs> but uh, Alan has been sharing creation in, um, uh, what, Chile? Chile? Yeah. And also in India. Uh, and also whenever he gets a chance, he's going to talk to us a little tiny bit why this is really that important. Okay. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with y'all. So uh, as Dave mentioned, uh, my, my wife and I are from Texas. And of course, uh, there are a few stereotypes of people from Texas. Uh, we're either a cowboy or we're drilling an oil well. And, uh, uh, unfortunately, I have a few cows, <laughs> and I am associated with the oil business, so I guess I fit the stereotype. I'm an engineer, and I, de uh, I design equipment used for exploring for uh, where to drill for oil, oil wells. And uh, so, uh, so I'm, uh, I fit the stereotype real well, but there's another stereotype of Texans, and that is that it's really hot. And uh, uh, of course, uh, it's pretty hot here sometimes too, as you know. But uh, it's a hot for a long period of time in Texas. So in July and August, all Texans look for a place to cool off. And so uh, half the state migrates to Colorado to, uh, to get, get up in the cool mountains. So that's what drew us to Colorado and to ultimately meeting uh, Mary Jo and Dave at, at a family camp, which was a really pivotal part of our lives. Uh, it, uh, a funny story we tell is the first time we went up to their family camp, uh, we, our boys at that time were ages like 14, uh, 9, and 4, or something like that. And uh, so we went there for a week and had a wonderful time, and we're driving back to Texas. And we said, okay, guys, we had a great time, so what do you all want to do next year? And they said, oh, we want to go back to the family camp. I said, well, you already heard the teaching once. Don't, don't you want to hear something else? No, no, we want to hear about creation again. So uh, this happened like every year for 10 years. <laughs> so we kind of grew up at uh, family camp in Colorado. And as Dave said, uh, since I'm a little bit of a slow learner, it took a little while, but it all sunk in. 
But uh, one thing that happened during that time is it rekindled a uh, passion of mine. And I've always had a bit of a passion for the uh, teaching of uh, creation and, and the Genesis story. Uh, because when I was a uh, first Christian, I became a Christian when I was 13, and uh, uh, I was uh, very new to Christ. My family was, uh, was not uh, a Christian family, and I was going to church by myself, and so uh, with another uh, friend and his family. And so I was just like a sponge, just, just, just uh, um, bringing, uh, pulling all this in. But of course, at 13 is also a very changed uh, time in, in a young person's life. And so I was in middle school and about to go to high school. And, and uh, a really important event happened in my life as I was uh, as a sponge. And I, I would just get my, my hands on any material about, uh, about the Christian walk. And uh, somehow, either I ordered or, or was uh, given a book called The Genesis Flood by Henry Morris. And uh, it was one of the uh, key uh, beginning books in the, uh, informa the, the stream of information that has, that has actually come since then. I mean, uh, he was one of the pioneers of the creation uh, teaching ministry that we have today. And, uh, but as a 13, 14 year old, of course, this book was literally that thick. It was a big, thick book. And so, uh, but I, I was had a kind of scientific orientation, so I kind of slogged my way through that book and, and absorbed as much as I could. But what I did get out of the book was that I could believe Genesis. And that was a key thing for me in my life because I was about to go into high school and I was about to take uh, high school biology. And so high school biology was a no-brainer for me because I went through there and we got to the evolution part and I said, oh, well, this is interesting information, but I know what's not true. And, uh, and uh, so it was, uh, the point I'm trying to make is with information like this, particularly you young people, um, you know, this gives you the information you need to see uh, disinformation or misinformation that, that you may be getting in school. And, uh, uh, and so uh, I encourage you to, to kind of get as much as you can, particularly young people, uh, because you're either going to high school or to college and, uh, and you need this because people were, particularly today, back then, people didn't use the evolution story so much as a, a weapon against Christianity back in the 60s and 70s. But they are now. It's a weapon that is used against young people. And you need it even more than I needed it. But I also encourage you that you don't have to be necessarily uh, belligerent about it when you're presenting this information. You can be very respectful, particularly to your uh, teachers and professors, because when I went through this, uh, 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 my first high school biology course, and I knew that this was not true, uh, what I did was, uh, when it came to the test part where we had to take the test, um, you know, I had to decide, okay, am I gonna tell them what they wanna know, or am I gonna, what am I gonna do? And so what I decided to do is I said, I'm gonna answer every question like what they, uh, you know, I, I answered, uh, you know, all the tests, all the questions. At the very bottom, I said, um, I've learned this material, but I respectfully want to say that I disagree with this. I believe in the Genesis account. And I got an A. <laughs> uh, not, maybe not every teacher's like that, but my teacher was an honest, honest guy and, and he gave me uh, an A. And so uh, I just encourage you to, uh, to take this information, not use it as a weapon, in, in the physical sense, use it as a weapon in the spiritual sense. Because our battle is not with teachers, our battle is not with professors, our battle's with an enemy, a spiritual enemy, the devil, who's using teachers and professors to try to influence you the wrong way. So your enemy is not a person or a teacher, your enemy is the devil who is trying to dissuade you, or any of us, from the right way. And uh, uh, just as a quick little side note, so that's when I was young. So, uh, uh, but the important part is that what you learn, and by learning that Genesis, the foundation of our faith, is an important thing, we find out that it has everything we need to know to live a Christian life. It really does. And all the principles are there for us. They're just in the Old Testament uh, fashion, and, and Jesus and, 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 uh, and the, uh, uh, um, uh, the apostles uh, expounded upon that 
Of course, Jesus was the fulfillment of prophecies in the Old Testament. But anyway, the point I want to make is that that foundation will help you in all of your life. Uh, when I was uh, uh, older and uh, had my own business, uh, I was presented with lots of opportunities to, to make money and, uh, uh, and do really exciting things. But what I found out was uh, when you're in the world, people try to get you to do things that are not biblical. And if you don't have a foundation and decide, I'm going to believe the Bible and do what the Bible says, you can easily be swayed to do something that is gray or shadowy. A specific example is a customer came to me and said, well, I want you to sell me this equipment, but you need to, um, uh, the commission that you're going to send, I need you to send to this person over here at this bank account. And it was a shady deal is what it was. And I said, well, I can't do that because that's not honest. And they literally said to me, well, who's going to know? If nobody finds out, then it must not be wrong. That was literally their uh, worldview or their, uh, their morality was doing so. If nobody finds out, then what's wrong with it? And so, uh, so if I had been weak in my faith or not known what the Bible teaches, I could have easily been dissuaded to do something just so I could make a little extra money. But I knew that that wasn't, and I said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. And they said, okay, well, then we can't buy the equipment. I said, okay, that's great. <laughs> I actually did end up buying the equipment, but, uh, but, but I had to take a stand. So I'm just saying that, that the, the, uh, the basis of our faith in the Old Testament, and in particularly in Genesis, makes a big difference in your everyday life. So I really encourage you, young people and old people, to pay attention and, 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 and learn how to base your, your life on Scripture, especially the, uh, because Genesis is the foundation of the rest. I mean, if, if we didn't know that Adam sinned, how would we know that we needed a Savior? And so uh, enjoy it. Thank you. a pleasure to be able to be good friends with Alan and Molly over the last quite a number of years now, okay? And Alan and Molly are the reason we are here today, actually, because uh, they're good friends with Pastor Pete, <laughs> okay? So uh, praise the Lord for that. Uh, anyhow, we're going to be talking about uh, can you really believe your Bible, okay? And uh, we're going to look at tremendous evidence of design as well. And just from the standpoint that uh, when you look at it, you, you say, can we look at the evidence out there? Can we really tell that there was a God? And I say, yeah, oh, yes, you can tell that. And uh, that's uh, basically what we're going to be talking about today. We're also talking about the idea of naturalism as well. We do do a publication called Think and Believe. Okay, and uh, how many did not get one of these last night? Raise your hand. Mary Jo and Molly would be passing these out uh, so that you can receive that. We're also going to be passing out, if you would start that thing right there, our uh, sign-up sheet for our publication called Think and Believe. That's what you're receiving a sample copy of. And uh, so just print your name and uh, uh, address on that and um, uh, the information you see. So uh, raise your hand high so they know who to give that to. So anyhow, last night we talked about the fossil record. If you missed, guess what? There's a book for you, <laughs> okay? The best book I know of on the fossil record. Uh, we talked about the uh, human evolution as well. Uh, another book you might want to look at is Contested Bones. And then we talked about the flood. The fossils and the flood kind of go together, don't they? And the uh, flood is responsible for the fossil record that we see, a good share of it anyhow. Uh, anyhow, uh, Alan talked about the Genesis flood, the latest update to that book. In a little easier to read format, by the way, is the global flood with hundreds of wonderful pictures in it. And if you see my presentation, you'll find out I like pictures. And so does Dr. John Morris, who is actually Henry Morris's son, uh, that uh, wrote, uh, was a co-author of that book that you wrote, 
or that you read, Alan. It's great. Uh, if you're going to the Grand Canyon, uh, or if you're not even going to the Grand Canyon, or if you want to know about the Grand Canyon, Bryce and Zion and Yellowstone, make sure you get these guidebooks. We talked about those last night. But th these resources will get you an idea of what we talked about last night, okay? Uh, it's very important to do it. Uh, you're signing up for this publication called Think and Believe, by the way. Well, today's presentation, we want to talk about the creation versus evolution in naturalism. And so what we want to say is, you know, you always hear creation is just a religious myth and evolution is science, correct? That's what we hear. I'm going to read something to you uh, out of what you just received, Bill Nye, the science guy. Okay, this was an ad in our local uh, newspaper. It said, science is the key to our future. And if you don't believe in science, you're holding everybody back. Now, Bill Nye's idea of science is evolution. Okay, keep that in mind. And it's fine if you as an adult want to run around pretending or claiming that you don't believe in evolution. Okay, um, it's okay. But if we educate a generation of people who don't believe in science, that's a recipe for disaster. We talk about the internet. That comes from science. The main idea in all of biology is evolution. To not teach it to our young people is wrong. And so here's what somebody who believes in naturalism, who actually claims also to be an atheist, thinks about it. They believe evolution is totally science. It to turns out both evolution and creation are religious in nature. Did you know that? At least the idea of it. Both require faith and both can be used to interpret the data, but we're not taught that at all, are we? All right. I'm going to say one step further, evolution requires faith in time, chance, and natural processes. Did you get that word faith? It's a faith statement, isn't it? Taking it a little deeper, evolution, as I said last night, is not science. It is a philosophy posing as science. It's a philosophy how we got here basically without God. It's the pillar of the naturalistic worldview, and naturalism is a worldview that says everything can be and is explained totally without a God, strictly by natural processes. All right? And that's what it says. Now, I'm going to illustrate that a little bit further, that evolution is not science. Naturalism really isn't science. It's a philosophy. How did the universe come into being? Okay, according to what's being taught in schools all over the country, how is, what do you hear? Big bang, don't you? Big bang. 16 billion years ago, there was a big bang explosion and all of the order in the universe came into being. Okay, now is that science? We're taught it is. Think about it. Here's what Discover Magazine, who's a magazine that is 100% committed to the idea of naturalism, no God system. They're committed to it. They won't use the God term. They will not use the word design because design means designer, right? But they said the universe burst into something from absolutely nothing. This is right off the front cover, okay? From absolutely nothing, zero, nada. And as it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. Hmm. Then they try to explain it with some kind of a theory that really doesn't hold any water at all, okay? So when I look at that, I think about it, and I said, hmm, nothing exploding. Does that sound like science? Or does that sound like philosophy? Philosophy. I believe the evidence out there cries out things were created and created with a design. It's hard to get around. And that's what we're going to talk about for a little bit while uh, today. And that's exactly what Pastor read just a little bit ago, right? Professing to be wise, they became fools. And I see that when I speak at the universities, and uh, Mary Jo and I talk about it, and we get these professors that say, but what if, and I say, well, maybe, <laughs> okay, but, and let's uh, get into these type of discussions, okay? Well, when I look at the created universe, did I use that word, created universe, and all the life in it? 
icy design. You look into a droplet of water under great magnification, you may see radial area. When I look at that, I see design. How about you? That's what it looks like. I look at those arrowheads and I say, I see design even though I did not see the designer who made them. Okay? How many of you would say that that particular painting came as a e result of an explosion in a paint factory? <laughs> Any takers? <laughs> no, I know better than that because my mother painted that actually. Okay? But anyhow, when we look at the natural world, we look at things that God created, we see design too. Now, I used to hate spiders. Well, I'm not that fond of them myself right now. But, you know, I got to appreciate them. I found out that the silk of a spider web is five times stronger than steel. Why is it so strong? Because it's not a single strand. And in fact, when you look at the backside of a spider under great magnification, you see all these spinnerets. The backside is a weaving factory. That single strand is a woven strand of fibers. And that's why if you had a rope made up of, a speeder, of a spider silk, no bigger than the end of your little finger, if that was the diameter of it, and you strung it across and made a web out of it or a net, strung it across the uh, canyon, it would stop a jet aircraft in mid-flight. That's how strong that stuff would be, okay? Uh, so I got a great appreciation of spiders now as a result of that. How many would say weaving factories like this happen by accident? No. It doesn't work, does it? Well, we can talk about a lot of other things, too. How about the uh, cooling system for a, for a dolphin? They get into um, warm water. They need to cool down, don't they? How do they do it? Well, it's the dorsal fin. It acts like the radiator of your car. And uh, it is so well designed, it's actually better than your radiator. So how does naturalism explain that? Okay, here's Discover Magazine, what they say. Remember, they don't use the God word or design word. They say this, by all rights, life in the sea should leave a dolphin baked. No way to cool himself with a thick blubber layer, okay? Crushed and sterile, this graceful mammal avoids such a fate only by slipping through the loopholes in the laws of physiology. They really didn't say anything. They just had to do a hand wave to explain away the obvious, it looks designed. All right? That's what they're doing here. So we have to understand and penetrate through some of these things that they're saying, all right? Look at the giraffe. It uh, needs blood to the brain to keep awake and to think, right? Uh, that means it has to have a pretty good sized heart to plump that blood all the way from that heart all the way up to that brain, right? Turns out the heart uh, of the giraffe is about two and a half feet long. It's a big hearted creature. <laughs> now, that poses a problem. You have all that blood pressure. What happens if the poor giraffe bends down to take a drink of water? Now you have gravity acting on that uh, blood, right? You should have uh, giraffes blowing their brains out with all that blood pressure. Turns out that isn't the case because there's a spongy mass material surrounding the brain that absorbs that flow, and there are valves in the neck, there are muscles that act like valves, to constrict that flow. It's an amazing design feature. We talk about all kinds of other things about the design of the giraffe, but that's just one thing about it. Now, what happens when uh, he hears a growl in the bushes and a lion is coming after him and he's taking a drink of water? What is he going to do? He's going to throw that head up in the air, right? He's going to throw out the, that head and he's going to take off running. Have you ever stood up too fast? This is even worse for the giraffe, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, he'd become good lion meat there, except for the valves open as quickly as they shut down and you get a constant flow of blood to that brain. It's a unique system. Well designed, it looks like a created by a designer, doesn't it? And that's what it looks like. 
Bombardier beetles are one of my favorite little insects. It actually can mix two chemicals together and shoot at a frog that's approaching it. And it shoots with machine gun rapidity, and it's very accurate. And uh, the poor frog says, I'm going to go elsewhere for my meal, okay? This does not taste good. Okay, now, it's also quite hot. Uh, the two correct, uh, chemicals, hydrogen peroxide, hydroquinone. He has special storage compartments for those two chemicals. There's mixing chambers, there are explosion chambers, several sets of valves, all of it working in unison. Now, how did that happen by accidents of evolution, slow and gradually over millions of years? Can you imagine the very first beetle that tried that? Went to the chemistry lab, began mixing chemicals, right? Right? Finally hit on the right combination. Ha <laughs> ha. Now you've got a better beetle, right? No, you got a dead beetle. So for millions of years, you have beetles blowing themselves up. That's not going to advance the case for evolution at all, is it? Not one bit. Everything has to be working and operating at the same time, or you have dead beetles. Right? So to me, that's an engineered system. Okay? Speaks of creation and not evolution. Okay? What's that? Take, just shout out what you think it is. Yep, okay, I usually get that. Broccoli. Now, how about the foot of a gecko lizard? Actually, it is. Every one of those little tiny pads on the gecko lizard, when you use a scanning electron microscope, you find out there are fibers that are so fine, you have 300 million of them per square inch. That's a lot of fibers, isn't it? The fibers are so fine, it makes a molecular bond with the surface that the foot is touching. And uh, that's why a um, gecko lizard can actually run across a ceiling on a plate glass. And if you tried to do a pull-up on that thing, okay, you could do a pull-up and that thing wouldn't let go. Of course, the lizard's not going to look like much. <laughs> But uh, that's how powerful those bonds are. And also, to release those bonds, he has a special gait when he's running, because this is directional. Now, isn't that an amazing design to be able to do that? Yeah. Well, we can copy that design. I think God wants us to copy his design. There's a new adhesive that's made. Now they use the inspiration from the gecko lizard foot. And uh, they made 260 million fibers per square inch and made it directional, just like a gecko lizard. We copied that. But you know what? It took millions of dollars of research in order to do it. Their goal is to produce Spider-Man gloves. Wouldn't you love to have a pair? All right? Rock climbers would really love that, huh? And in fact, here's an article that said sticky tape, that's what they're calling this, turns mortals into Spider-Man. Great system, isn't it? But we have to copy God's design to make it. And um, so that tells me the original was designed as well. Okay. Sea anatomy, this guy is hunting. At the end of every one of those dart uh, tentacles is a dart capsule. And it has a spring-loaded missile. And uh, not only is it spring-loaded, there's a trigger and a trap door, and there's poison on the tip of that. A fish hits that thing. The trap door opens, missile fires, and the sea anemone gets a meal. Pretty unique. Missiles don't happen by accident, do they? How would you like to eat one of those, though? Huh? You ready to have a whole plate of sea anemones? Wouldn't that be great? All those missiles going around in your stomach, or going off in your stomach? Not so good. All right. But there is a creature that eats a sea anemone, swallows it whole. It's called the sea slug. And... Uh, Everything is digested except those missiles. Now, what's it going to do with all those missiles rattling around in its stomach? Well, here's a clue. The sea slug has tentacles, but it has no ability to manufacture its own poison system. So he takes the missiles from the sea anemone that just was digested, ferries them up into his own tentacles, One's put in place, first fish comes along, bam, this missile fires again. 
What you are looking at is a creature that pirates another's missile system and uses it for his own. How did that happen by slow and gradual processes of evolution? Can you imagine any scenario? Wow. Woodpeckers make their living hitting their head against a tree. They're actually living jackhammers, aren't they? All right. And um, you say he hits his head against the tree with a force of deacceleration of a thousand times the force of gravity. That's amazing. He's really hitting it. Well, with that kind of force and hitting it brrr, just like that, why doesn't he fold up his beak like an accordion? How come his eyeballs don't pop out of his head? It's because of special design features. There's a film that closes down over his eye every time he hits his head against a tree, and that keeps the eyeballs in and the wood chips out. Very important. Okay? And there's a special piece of cartilage between the beak and the skull. And what that does is keep him from scrambling his brains, right? Very important design features. But you say, sounds like a dumb bird hitting his head against a tree, all right? Well, he's hungry, that's why he does that. And a lot of you do things strange like that too when you're really hungry, right? Of course you do. Now, he hears a bug on the inside of the bark of the tree and he is going after it, okay? Now, with all the noise he's making, of course, the bug says, oh, somebody, somebody's coming, I better get out of here, and they'll boogie or scram, and they would be safe except for one thing. And there are long tunnels, and how would the woodpecker get it? Because he has a long, long tongue. Okay, and it has sticky barbules on the end of it, and he slaps that thing down into that tunnel and gets his bug. But here's the rub. That tongue is about four and a half times longer than his skull. What would you do with a tongue that long? Yeah. <laughs> Woodpecker doesn't have a shirt pocket to put it in, right? If he leaves it hanging out, hanging out when he's pecking a hole in the tree, what's going to happen? He's going to peck the thing right off, isn't he? Yeah, so there's got to be a solution. What's the storage? Well, there it is, right there, right there. The tongue comes out of the back of the mouth, wraps around the skull, attaches up there in the beak region. It's elastic like a rubber band, and there are muscles that pull it down into the chest cavity. Unique design, isn't it? Okay. Hmm. Which happened first, the long tongue or the storage compartment, if evolution is true? What good is the storage compartment without the long tongue? And if you have the long tongue without the storage compartment, you're going to choke to death, aren't you? You see, everything has to be working and operating in place. Well, the, the evolutionists will say, well, yeah, you look at design, but there's so many things that are poorly designed. Think about this. Do you realize that you swallow with the very same tube that you're breathing out of? Why, you could choke to death. And in fact, Richard Dawkins, one of the leading atheists, says this is a, a, more than ridiculous. He calls this design the height of stupidity. That's what he says about our God. Uh, that's the atheist perspective and the naturalist perspective here. Well, let me ask you one question. How many of you sitting here right now or listening on our streaming video, how many of you have choked to death this morning? Something is working, right? Hmm. And if Richard Dawkins says it could be made better, how would he do it? How many tubes would he have, right? And where would he put those extra tubes in order to do it? And what happens if Richard Dawkins has us to design something else and he gets a piece of something ch uh, halfway down his gullet, down his throat? What is he going to do? How is he going to get it out of there? If he doesn't have that wind, to push it out from the lungs, he's going to have to figure out a different solution, isn't he? Maybe send a fish hook down and pull it out, right? Uh, a big plunger, boom, 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 right? Uh, maybe that'll work. I could not even be speaking to you this morning if it wasn't for this design. Because speech is made possible not only by the air coming out from the lungs, but also from the larynx, it's also from the um, 
position of the mouth and the teeth and the tongue. It's one beautiful little capsule like a Swiss army knife that's well designed. And that's what our God does. He makes multiple functions of the same thing. That's what? Evidence of a master designer, isn't it? Okay, okay. Think, think about my computer. It's an amazingly well designed, isn't it? But do you realize my computer won't come close to doing what your computer does? Your computer inside your head, right, works much faster than my computer. It can multitask more too, especially the girls. Okay? <laughs> you can really do that. Now, anyhow, it's amazing design, but it doesn't come close to doing what your brain will do. Question. If my computer was designed and your computer is designed better, what does that tell you about your brain? It was designed, okay? It was designed by an amazing, amazing designer. All right, think about it. The total number of synapses in a brain is roughly equal to the number of stars in 1,500 Milky Way galaxies. Do you realize that's a lot of stars? These are galaxies, and every one of the galaxies have billions and billions of stars. A single human brain has more switches than all the computers and routers and internet connections on the face of planet Earth. If you want to know more about the design and complexity of the brain and also about the cell, ah, that's in this book right there. You can get that from our website. Amazing design, what we're seeing. How do the naturalistic viewpoint explain all this then? Remember, they have to come up with some answer, right? So you get this, perhaps an early cell billions of years ago developed a sensitivity to other cells. Then it is conceivable it would be on its way to becoming a human brain. And by the way, perhaps, the words perhaps and conceivable aren't scientific terms, are they? They're throwing out something to try to come up with some explanation so they don't have to face God, right? That's what's going on. I'm going to say this. When I look at the brain, when I look at other design features, I'm going to have to say, no, it's inconceivable. Oh, you've seen the movie too, <laughs> Princess Bride, right? <laughs> inconceivable to think it happened by accident. Now, paleontology threw the naturalists for a loop when they found that an ancient crustacean way, way down deep in those rock layers possessed a brain almost ident or identical to what the crustaceans living today had. They already had an extremely complex brain way back when. And so this idea that the brain developed slowly and gradually over all those millions of years, I think no longer works, okay? So how do the naturalists explain all these design features that we're looking at? If I go to the university, every one of these, by somebody who is committed to atheism, is explained away by one idea. We can imagine, they'll say, how mutations working with natural selection acting over millions of years might refine systems. Keep in mind, imagine and might are not scientific terms. Okay? And they're right. We can imagine, but that doesn't mean it happened that way, right? By the way, you would need something there to begin with in order for evolution to refine, right? You're going to need a tongue before you can get a longer tongue. You're going to have to have a storage compartment before the whole thing works, right? So you have to have something there to work. And yes, you can imagine. But imagination is not observation. And observation is the key to science, isn't it? And that's one thing that Bill Nye has gotten wrong when, he, when I read you that ad in that newspaper, right? They got it wrong. He equates science and imagination and evolution together, doesn't he? That's, that's a big problem. Well, let me show you some things that I don't think slow and gradual processes are going to really explain. How many got a cut in the last 100 years? Okay, the reason you didn't die is a special blood clotting system, right? And 
There's a substance in your body, a piece of this word right here called fibrin that actually makes the blood clot. It's a long sticky molecule. You get a lot of them coming and crisscrossing and you get a net or a web across that blood vessel. Okay, right, that's gonna produce your blood clot, keep you from dying. Okay, now what happens if you have a lot of uh, fibrin in your blood right now? What do you think? You're a goner, right? You're dead, okay? Your history, they would say. Okay, so fibrin has to exist in an inactive form, and that form is called fibrinogen. You got that? All right, now when you get a cut, something's got to activate or turn on the fibrinogen and make fibrin. Otherwise, you'll die, okay? Well, what turns on the fibrinogen? A piece of this word, thrombin, turns this on, gets you your blood clot. Now, question, what happens if you have a bunch of thrombin in your blood right now? You're dead again, right? Yeah, whoa, that's a problem. It exists in an inactive form called prothrombin. Something's got to activate it. What is that? An activated form of the Stewart factor. Well, let's make it a little bit shorter here. Every one of these are needed. Everyone needs to be turned on or activated. The entire system works together, or none of it works at all. You're dead. You understand this is a design system. An engineer can recognize how one thing then turns another thing, turns this and turns that on. It's a cascade type system, isn't it? Okay, it's just so you don't go out of here thinking this is simple. How do you even activate that one right there, a Stewart factor? How do you activate it? Here are all the different steps. Do you understand? This is a well-designed cascade system. It speaks to me of a creator designer not slow and, and gradual processes of evolution. That's not going to cut it at all. It's not going to happen. So how do the naturalists and those who really believe in evolution from strictly no God system explain all of this? How do they do that? Well, <clears throat> they say, well, somehow we got an atmosphere around our world after the Big Bang, right? Wherever that came from. Lightning zapped through the atmosphere, hit those chemicals, made bigger chemicals called amino acids. They lined up like bees on a string to form proteins. Those plus a thousand other things accidentally made the very first cell. Sounds really good, right? No. It takes a lot of faith to believe it could happen by accident. Let me show you how much faith that really is. Um, we're going to look into probability. That's one of the greatest arguments against uh, the idea of uh, naturalistic evolution. The chance of one protein happening by accident is one chance in 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, 260 times. Now, that's a big number, in case you don't know that, okay? To show you how big a number that is, you can only put 10 to the 84th power marbles into the entire known universe, a hundred times bigger than what anybody has ever suggested it to be. Okay? So it's a big number. To illustrate uh, what I'm talking about, uh, let me pick on somebody. Uh, Pastor Anthony, what's your favorite color? Green. Green, okay. And let's just think about this. Pastor Anthony, ever since he was a little guy this big, had this favorite green marble. Okay? It's the only one made like it. Okay? And you would see him walking around. It's like, oh, I love my marble. I love my marble. Huh? He'd hide it under his pillow at night. Right? Still does, huh? <laughs> I mean, this is a favorite marble. And I get mean. I sneak into his room and I steal his green marble, okay? And I hide it out there in the universe someplace, and I fill up the entire rest of the universe with red marbles, okay? And I said, ha ha, Pastor Anthony, I stole your marble. Go out and find it. And I put him in a spaceship, send him out as far as he wants, any direction he wants. What's blindfolded? What's the chance he's going to find it? And it's no fair praying. <laughs> Got to be accidental. What's the chance if he can find it? If he, lucky pastor, if he can find it now once, not twice, but three times in a row, 
Do you realize that is 100 million times easier than making one simple protein by accident? I mentioned that to the university statistics course I was teaching at the time and uh, showed the, I don't know what they teach you in biology about these kind of odds, but in statistics, we call that zero. Guess what? That was five minutes before I heard from the department chairman. I understand you're, <sighs> he was out of breath, preaching religion in the classroom. Religion? Not at all. And I told him exactly what I told the students. I'm glad to do it, right? I said, is that religion? I said, I guess not. But however, this evolution versus creation stuff is a touchy subject here. You better drop it. I didn't, and that's why I can go around this country sharing on creation, okay? <laughs> Anyhow, but do you realize it takes DNA to make proteins? It takes about 70 specific proteins to make DNA. So which came first? So the plot thickens a little bit, doesn't it? And that wasn't even a cell. What's the probability of a cell? An atheist and an agnostic decided to calculate the probability of a cell happening by accident. And protein is just one little piece of it, right? You know what they found out? It was one chance in 10 to the 40,000th power. They said it was more likely for a tornado to sweep through a junkyard and produce a Boeing 747 complete and ready to fly than to make one single cell. Then they were quoted in the newspapers, there must be a God. Well, did they run out and buy a Bible to find out about that God? No. They said, we are still looking for a way around our conclusions. And see, that's what you have to do if you're committed to the philosophy or worldview of naturalism, right? You have to try to explain it away. And I think there's some things you can't explain away. You know, you heard the idea that 95% uh, of the DNA in your body is junk left over from millions of years of evolution. Mary Jo is going to be talking a little bit about that tonight uh, when she talks about the best evidence of evolution from biology and what's wrong with that. Okay, was Darwin wrong about biology? But junk DNA, they found out it's no longer junk. It's, they're finding out it's not only quite useful, but it's very important in very important functions, uh, like helping to fight disease. How about regulating embryological development? Is that important or not? <laughs> yes, it is. It's not junk. So if you ever heard in a classroom that, evolution, that uh, most of the DNA in your body is junk, that was actually stated that way in textbooks before they did the research because they just figured it had to be if evolution is true, okay? It was a, a, a fact necessitated by the uh, philosophy of naturalism. Um, we can talk about a lot of things, but there are thousands of articles coming out there now talking about tremendous design in the DNA designed even with the proteins, working with the DNA. Mary Jo is going to touch on some of that this evening, so I'm not going to talk about that today. The point is, it's a great day to be a Bible-believing creationist. It is. There's so much evidence in our favor right now that's so hard to explain by evolutionary naturalism. But what do the evolutionists and naturalists have to say about it? They're committed to naturalism, the worldview, right? And they might be blinded to it. Here's what Dr. Scott Todd says. Even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, such an hypothesis is excluded from science because it is not naturalistic. Okay, naturalism has to have this way. And what, young people, what are you being taught in school? Evolutionary naturalism, right? Unless you're homeschooled. <laughs> you're being taught evolutionary naturalism, aren't you? And that's about the only thing that is being taught across this country. And so it's hard not to come out believing in evolution. All right? I say evolution, again, is a philosophy posing as science. It is not science at all. Colossians 2.8 is another great verse for you to remember. It says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and vain deceit. 
right? If evolution is philosophy and it's not science, what's it trying to tell you? Don't be taken captive by evolutionary philosophy, too. We can apply that, couldn't we? All right? Well, the last thing about design is beauty. It could have been a black and white world, couldn't it? But what do we see? Tremendous beauty out there and all everywhere. And I think it's because God is an artist and he loves beauty, right? Even in a droplet of water where it takes a microscope to see it, there's intense beauty. Wow, it looks like God has a signature even in a droplet of water. But you also look out into the DNA. When you look closer, it even gets better. More and more complexity. It's like peeling an onion, layer after layer after layer of complexity is what we're seeing. But also, when we look out into the universe, what do we see? Tremendous order, tremendous complexity. In fact, if you want to know about that, there's a wonderful video called Astronomy, a set of three of them. This is easy to understand, and it really shows you where, where the naturalistic philosophy doesn't work. It's, uh, if you love astronomy, you'd love these videos, too. And it leaves you praising our Lord God. Okay? Wonderful. But the thing is, we look at the universe, what do we see? Tremendous complexity. Right? Do you realize what you're looking at right here? It shows you the size of our universe. That is the um, part of the sky that would be obscured by holding a screen of sand at arm's length out there. You understand what I'm saying? That's looking through the Hubble telescope. That's a lot of stars. In fact, most of what you're looking at was galaxies. And God says in the Bible, in Psalms 147, verse 4, he numbers the stars. He calls them all by name. What does that tell you about the power of God, like in Romans? What does that tell you? He's powerful, isn't he? He's powerful. But there's something else in Psalm 147 I really like. It's a verse 3, right before that. Verse 3 tells you something about this God. God numbers the stars, calls them all by name, but he also heals the brokenhearted and binds up all their wounds. This is a God who's all-powerful, but he also is a caring God. And if you have hurts in your life, this God can heal them, can't he? You understand what I'm saying? Wonderful God. Isn't this a God that we could worship? I don't worship the God of accidents. Okay? This is a God that's worthy of our worship. He's a powerful God, but a loving God who cares for us. If you haven't given your heart and your life to him, do so immediately. <laughs> it's an amazing thing when you do, okay? It really is. I believe the evidence out there just cries out, create with design. I'm going to give you a couple of resources that's available for you, okay? Our newsletter. You already signed up for it, I hope. Come to one of our camps uh, that we could talk about the design in Costa Rica. That's what we're doing next March, March 23, April 1. All right, Yellowstone Adventure, camps. You can come this year or next year, Labor Day weekend, all right? Labor Day, Labor Day weekend, come and look, listen to the design features of Yellowstone and geological features as well to be able to find out how this supports the biblical record as well. All right, we have our website, discovercreation.org. And um, those of you who are listening on live stream video, if you want to receive our publication, Think and Believe, uh, make sure that you go ahead and go online there and you can sign up for that thing, okay? Uh, so a lot of resources. We have some on the back table there. Um, research, the best book for kids on dinosaurs and adults, by the way, is Guide to Dinosaurs. Then there's another little book back there. It's a wonderful little book on dinosaurs as well. Uh, and then we have a, uh, uh, so many things. The Answers book, Answers 20, well, each one answers a bunch of questions that people ask about creation versus evolution. And you can get a whole set of them and save money, by the way. But why am I saying this? I'm not just a salesman. 
You need resources in order to battle the spiritual battle that's going on in front of you, okay? And uh, young people, a high percentage of them, basically lose their faith because of evolutionary naturalistic teaching. And that's so sad. And that number is 70 to 85% of the young people sitting in churches today. That's serious, okay? You need answers for them, and that's what that whole set is all about. And that's more for the, somebody who's willing to study, okay? Guide to Basics. Again, this uh, Guide to Creation. Wonderful book to get the basics on creation, okay? So that you're not taken captive by evolutionary philosophy. I love this one. What don't they tell you in the classroom? It's called Censored Science. Suppressed Evidence. Beautiful, colorful book. Wonderful uh, resource for you. Uh, the resource for the entire family, Unlocking the Mysteries of Creation, ages 5 to 105. Lots of beautiful pictures. I like pictures, right? I like the book. Our DVD set. We're, only, we're selling it for only $30 for you, okay? That's an amazing deal for you because we want you to use this material and give it out. What a Christmas present to you impact somebody else this year, right? I really would encourage you to do that. It's good for about fourth or fifth grade on up through adult. Uh, the inspired evidence, this is a day-by-day devotional. You need to use this to fortify yourself, your family, and maybe your neighbors, okay? So I encourage you, reach out, reach out. Day-by-day devotional. Every page is one day, so it's so simple to utilize, okay? So can you believe the Bible? Amen. Yes, you can. Thank you so much for your invitation. See you tonight for dinosaurs and also the best evidence from biology and what's wrong with it. Okay? And you'll hear Mary Jo on that one. Okay. God bless. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's, uh, let's stand together. And uh, am I going to lead this next song? I'm going to lead this next song. I want to encourage I want to encourage you to um, to come out tonight. Warfare, or can't remember exactly, but there was uh, an example given of uh, so- soldiers who were going through basic training. And this is um, just before the, the outbreak of the Vietnam War. And uh, they were learning the material and they were bored to death with it. And, and the, uh, you know, whoever, whoever oversees training, they were trying to figure out a way of, of getting a, a different material or something to keep, to keep everybody interested in the training process. And, um, and then the Vietnam War broke out. And all of a sudden, now everybody that was involved with this basic training was glued to learning the material and to enthusiastically training. What happened? See, there was a realization that there was a battle that they were going to be in. Three, four, five months later, they'd be in the jungles of Vietnam fighting for their lives. And it was that understanding. And so, you know, in a big way, that's what happens in a believer's life when they realize you're in a battle. Now, the devil would like to just sort of sedate you and uh, have you live lethargically, you know. And, uh, And yet, when truth sparks to the fact that you're in a battle and that people are losing their lives all around you and that you have an enemy that would just love not to even harass you if you'll just go into this sublime kind of a way of thinking to where you're just put to sleep you know and the bible tells us to be alert you know walk circumspectly not as fools but wise redeeming the time and so um, I want to encourage you, you know, to, um, to come back tonight and um, appreciate so much. The message was over the top. And uh, it's an encouragement because we have uh, a real, um, 
you know, evidence of our Creator God. And so, and also, as David would encourage you, hey, if you haven't committed your life to Jesus Christ yet, do it now. Because it is amazing to have, to live life not dreading your demise, but celebrating everlasting life, even while you're enjoying this temporal life that we have. And so as your outer man gets weaker and weaker, your inner man becomes stronger and stronger. I'm so excited about life. I'm so excited about the word. I'm so excited about God's plans. You think, why? You're getting older. It's harder to get up. <laughs> you have to plan getting down on your knees and getting up. You know, It's like, why are you so excited? And I go, I'm just filled up with the spirit of God and I'm blown away. Um, and also, you know, I'm excited about Wednesday and the things we're going to talk about and share. It's vitally important. And so, you know, you have this um, incredible uh, temptation because of technology and the modern world that we live in. Don't fall for it. You know, serve the living God. You know, use technology to its fullest to serve the living God, not to serve yourself. And so, um, so if you need prayer, come on up here afterwards. We'll have somebody here to pray for you. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. God bless you. There's food downstairs. Hang out and fellowship. Have a great day.